The single most important gift in the world, in my mind, is the gift of communication. The greatest tool of influence all leaders have is communication. You cannot influence where you cannot communicate. It's impossible. So learning to communicate is a critical skill for any of you who think of yourselves as leaders. Of course, learn to communicate. But if you were to learn to communicate, the question becomes communicate for what purpose? What's the outcome? 99% of the time, the reason we human beings communicate is to either get somebody to do something we want them to do or to get somebody to see something we want them to see. So either I want you to take action or I want to change your perspective. But either way, to do both of these things, I need to communicate. I need to influence. I need to, as the language says, persuade. Need motivation? Watch your top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Vusi Tembequeo and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, take that step. Everybody is starting at zero. Everybody. So you're watching this and you've got that business idea that you've been thinking about forever, but you haven't done it. You're watching this and there's that qualification, that certification, that degree you've been thinking of going after, but you're not doing it. You're watching this and there's that person you've had a crush on forever, but you don't think that they would ever date you. You know the one? You know that person where you put your profile on private on Instagram? so that you can stalk them and they don't see that you're watching all their stories. You know yourself, comrade, you know yourself. <laughs> you know who you are. You're watching this and you're wondering if you're good enough. The company you work at has got a job posted and there's a promotion and you think you can do that job but you just don't know if you're good enough. I came to tell you two things. The first thing I wanna tell you is when it comes to pursuing new opportunities, everybody starts at zero. Everybody, make sure you're the most prepared. The second thing I want to tell you is when the noise is ringing in your head about how you don't belong in that room, the only way to quieten that noise is to focus on the things you do control and the things you can do. So for the entrepreneurs right now who are wondering if your business is going to improve, focus on the next proposal you're sending out. Focus on the next client with whom you're in a sales call with. Focus on the next presentation you have to prepare. Focus on the next candidate you're trying to hire. Focus on next. Because you don't have to know where the lift goes. You just have to know that if you take one step up the stairway, Sooner or later, you're going to end up exactly where the lift ends up. All the way at the top. Rule number three, own your faults. Own it. Own your misgivings. Own your faults. Own your fears. Own your doubt. Own your screw-ups. Own it. I screwed up. It was my mistake. I'm sorry. Own that stuff. See, for most of us, we don't like owning our faults because then it means that we have to fix them. Own it. I'll tell you guys an interesting story about a fault that I had to own. I hired the wrong people. For one of my businesses, I, um, this is, by the way, I've got to tell you guys an interesting truth. I don't hire people anymore. I've decided that I'm not the most effective person to hire people. So what I've done is I've hired people who are really good at hiring people. And I leave them to make the call. I don't interfere and I don't get involved. And the reason for this is when I hire people, I see who people can be at their best. I believe in people's potential. And over the years I've learned that people are not who they are at their best. Often they are who they are at their worst. If somebody has a sense of malevolence or darkness or any sense of evil, if somebody is a you know, serial liar, if somebody is malicious or they want to destroy, trust me, if they're doing that in their personal life or in their, 
in any other element of their life, they're going to bring that stuff to work. They might not show it at the interview, but they're definitely going to bring it to work. And so over the years I've learned, I'm not the best person to hire. And I learned just hiring the wrong people and watching something I had built almost destroyed. And it took me 18 months, if not more, of hard, long hours and slog to rebuild that business. Now, the only way I was able to do the 18 long months, 19, was because I owned up to the fact that we ended up in the position we ended up in because I made those decisions. I made those calls. I did. I own that. And I remember as we were rebuilding that business and new partners came on board and the rest of it, the conversation came up about, you know, what happened to business X version 1.0? And I was like, no, I, I exact words I used was I f***ed it up. I hired the wrong people and those wrong people chased away the right people. Because here's how things work. If you have a Premier League soccer team with 22 players on, exclude the coaching staff, and you hire three people into that team who are malicious, they're gossipers, they're liars, and they destroy. Of the 22 people, I guarantee you those three people will change the odds. Because the first thing they'll do is they'll turn the good people against each other. And good people are good people. So what do they do? They believe everything the malicious people say. This is why psychopaths are so successful. It's precisely why psychopaths are so successful. You don't believe me? Go ahead and read um, Jordan um, Peterson's book. He talks about this. And so the three people will turn. And in a year, you will end up with one of two scenarios. Either a soccer team that doesn't have all of the team it needs, because when people left, you didn't replace them. Or worse, you will end up with a soccer team where of the 22 people, there's now only three left who are good. And all the other good ones have left. And the other 19 is the riffraff and the rubbish that the bad people bring with them. I said this to the young mentee, and I'll end with this, who asked me the question, how do you build trust? I said the following. I said, the universal truth is that God works through people. So does the devil. Think about that. Rule number four, solve problems. Sometimes the solution is predicated by how we think and understand the problem. Can you help me now and jump forward now that I've covered this? Sometimes the solution is predicated by how we think and understand the problem set that we're solving. Think and understand the problem set that you're solving. So here's a question for you that I'd like for you to make a note for yourself. Here's the question. What problem are you solving? What problem are you solving? Subtitle question, who told you that that was the real problem? <laughs> who told you that that was the real problem? What problem are you solving? And who told you that that was the real problem? Who told you that that was the real problem? I keep referencing my, my brother Julian because I think he and I are so aligned. He said something earlier about the number of startups that are failing, right? I think actually that what really happens in that experiment you were talking about is startup founders are figuring out that the, the problem they were solving is not the problem to be solved. That's actually really, if you think, that's all innovation is, isn't it? Innovation is the presumption of a problem, seeking a solution to it, and then figuring out that that's not the real problem. And so you keep asking the question, what is the problem until you find it? Until you actually find it. What is the problem that you're solving? What is the problem that you're solving? All of this comes down to that point I made earlier, that singularity that you have to be able to fall in love. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific 
plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, overcome self-doubt. I wanted to come into a space today uh, just to say, it's okay if, um, if you're doubting yourself. It really is okay. I think one of the greatest lies of our modern time and one of the greatest lies of this generation is this idea that nobody ever doubts themselves, that this imposter syndrome is only for the select few, but actually the high achievers don't suffer from it. The truth of it is that most high achievers are high achievers precisely because they doubt themselves. They are high achievers precisely because they don't feel like they're competent or worthy or good enough to be in the room. They are high achievers precisely because they think everybody else is better than them. And so they prepare more, they work harder, they commit more time. I think that's just the nature of achievers. Rule number six, build trust. How do you build trust? Like, do you build trust or is trust developed over time? When you start a relationship with someone, do they implicitly trust you? Or do people learn to trust you based on what you do and what you say and how you behave? How do you build trust? The truth of it is that um, at a personal level, 90% um, of everything I've done and everything by God's grace I've been able to achieve has been because I have relationships based on trust. My partners across all of my businesses, whether it's my holdings business or my investments businesses or um, various people I've worked with in different capacities, putting together a show, traveling the world, writing a book and publishing, all of this, all of this has been relationships built on trust. And so when Lynette asked me the question, how do you build trust? It really got me thinking. Because for me, I think I did it uh, naturally. It just naturally came to me. Like, this is what I should do if I want to learn, if I want to earn from these relationships. This is what I should do if I cherish these relationships. Now, you can go and Google this. Like, how do you build trust? And you get a couple of tips, right? So this is not a Google 10 steps of how to build trust. What I'm hoping to do is to give you my process and my experience about how do you really build trust? Because I think the central problem that most people have when it comes to building trust is that you try to do something that's not natural. And so what happens over time is the other person, the other party in the relationship can feel that you're playing a character. And talk a bit about that first. So the first thing to do if you want to build trust is stop playing a character. Rule number seven, do the work. So you don't have the right to anything. The minute you become a business person, the idea that you have the right must leave your mind. You don't have the right. At best, you're hoping for the opportunity and because you want to succeed, you have created upon yourself the obligation and you want to approach it with a sense of humility. But you don't have the right, yeah? So when you, the, the way you phrased the question was, I see a building, it's owned by X, I would like to use that building, but I'm being told I need X amount of money. And my answer to that is, what's wrong with that? The owner of the building has the full right to tell you what are the terms for them for you to use their building. In the same as in 10 years time, God willing, touch wood, that building is yours. When I come to you and I say I'd like to use your building, I think you're going to determine for me what are the terms for me to use your building. Make sense? So this is important for us to get our narrative right. You don't have the right, guys. 
you don't have the right. And I think it's important for us to pause on this because much of our national discourse has been wrong. And okay, I don't want to be misunderstood. We created a narrative discourse of free. Free housing for all. Then we said free education for all. And free this and free that. Except month end, somebody has to pay for that which is free. And the economics of it are not very complex. If you build a free house, who's building it? A contractor. Month end, must that contractor be paid? Yes. Because if that contractor happens to be anybody, whether they are black or white, they have staff that must be employed, who must be paid. So this free, where does it start if the cost to construct is paid for? They will argue from a macroeconomic perspective that the state should fund it. And I don't want to have a long mesoeconomic debate here. That's not the point of our masterclass. But in your mind, when you become an entrepreneur, free, right, must leave your head. You must presuppose you're going to pay for everything you do. This masterclass, how much did you guys pay for this? I'm wondering, how much did you pay? Free? It's free, right? Right, so, so the master class is free. Who thinks that the electricity in this room is free? No? Yeah, what about the time of the very capable and amazing technical people who are recording and streaming and taking pictures and the rest of it? Think that's free? So I'm here, right? My whole team is here. Who thinks that's free? Make sense? What you're not aware of is that I have a business model, you just can't see it. But I've got a revenue model. It's gonna make me more money than you can imagine, but I've got one in my mind. Yeah? What I've worked out is I'm working on a model called freemium. I'm doing in effect what Facebook does. Your Facebook account is free, or so you think. It's not really, yeah? See, I just figured out a different way of how to do these things. Because for me, it's about empowering and sharing. But sooner or later, somebody's going to have to pay the piper. So to answer your question, you can break into any industry. You just got to approach it right. So what I would do if I was you is I would go to them and I would try and find a way where they can meet you halfway rather than have a uh, fiduciary, pecuniary conversation. Hey, guys, I'm a business. I'd like to use your business. Can we do some business? I wouldn't do it that way. I'd approach it at a human level, and I'd go to them and say, this is what I want to do. My mind is kind of fuzzy. Can we work together to try and find a way to do it? Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I want to take the next question, but just to, finish, just to finish with your question for a minute. So if you guys ever go on YouTube and you watch our first masterclass, have you seen it? Yeah. There must have been, what, maybe 10, 15 people in the room? And they're all sitting on like camp chairs, right? Yeah. Right, so I want to say this to you. When you're an entrepreneur, you, ha you have to start. Okay. In your mind, what the, what the business you're building, you must see in your mind all the time. Yeah. But don't think where you're starting is where you're going to be. So allow you, just start. You know, it's like a, just, just with the small thing, do that one. And maybe for, maybe for them it's not renting out the whole building, maybe it's just giving you a floor. Okay, so do it that way. Start scrappy. And, and it's so important, I just want to, just allow me to reinforce this point. It's so important to start scrappy because you can make all the mistakes with a business that's this big. So that when it's this big, you know exactly what the problems are. Do you know what I mean? There's some, I'm sure you guys would have seen it online, for those of you who watch the masterclasses, there's some masterclasses where the video quality is terrible, you can barely hear the stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we did it. You understand? Like we did it, right? You know, and then, and then in a year or two's time, people go, whoa, these are amazing. Yeah, but you didn't see the beginning. Remember, only you see the beginning. You know, only you and a few early adopters, they see the beginning. Most people usually come in at the end. Rule number eight, unlearn insecurities. I think... <laughs> I think that a lot of us instinctively know that we're good enough. 
But I think that our insecurities are learned. Insecurity is learned. It's learned by your socialization, by your environment. It's learned by the things you're told and the things you're exposed to. Some of you don't think you're good enough to do certain things because the people you're competing with, if you read their profiles or their businesses' profiles or their careers, it looks like they're on an upward trajectory. But don't forget this, eh? It's called PR for a reason. Nobody puts the bad shit down. Nobody. So if you're reading the story about your competitor and all you're seeing is successes, it's not because they're succeeding all the time. It's because that's all they are highlighting. So the focus for you should be on how do I compete? Just do the next thing. Just one more thing. I want to leave you with this little bit of homework for yourself. Now, the first thing I want to say to you is that if you catch yourself having a negative conversation with yourself, stop yourself and call yourself out on your own BS. And the second thing I want to say to you, as a believer, I believe this. I believe that my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has put in me the dreams that I have and he's put in me the capabilities, skills, and competencies to achieve those dreams. And where I don't have those skills and competencies, he will maneuver the universe to surround me with people who have the right intent and heart to take me to the place he wants me to go. I genuinely believe it. So the qualification you need is the dream you have. The fact that you have that dream, the fact that you believe that thing, that you're seeing that vision, that's good enough. That's how you know you're on a winning innings. Rule number nine, be outrageously consistent. The consistency test, I think, is one of the hardest. Easily the hardest thing to do is to, is to be consistent. And the reason it's hard to be consistent is because life happens. We're all dealing with life. And so, you know, I, it's like those people who say, if, if you want to have your best body, just go to gym for six months. Six months. <whistles> and six months is a long time. Six months is a long time. You know, that's 30 days in a month. Six months, six, 12, eight, that's 180 days. Consistently? That's, that's, that's gonna be a stretch. That's gonna be a stretch. Um, so the test of consistency, is, the point is that consistency is, is difficult. But one of the things you learn about consistency is in the beginning, it's really, really hard. The more consistent you are at something, then actually what happens is your body builds up the habit to do the thing naturally. Your body just like does that thing. So the beautiful thing about consistency is that the more often you do something, the more consistent you are. Then what happens is, in my mind I can almost see the graph, but like mathematically, the level of resistance you're facing to do it declines as you become more effective at it, right? And so this thing kicks in called habit, where habitually you begin to do something. And when you don't do that thing, your body tells on you. Your body's like, I feel like something is missing. You, you ever gotten into the habit of having a, a fresh cup of coffee every morning when you wake up? What happens on the one day you don't have your fresh cup of coffee? Something almost doesn't fit. It's almost as if your body is, is reacting and your mind is reacting because there is something built into your habit that you've now become. That's how you build up the test of consistency. So consistency is about just being consistent. Do the thing even when you don't feel like doing it and do it as if you were looking forward to doing it. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is be genuinely kind. I think the inconsistency of our experiences with each other on earth is that we're frankly just not honest. We're not authentic. We're playing a character. And then when somebody leaves us, all of a sudden we all want to be more authentically connected. We want to be woke. We want to elevate and talk about issues of mental health. 
But I don't know that many of us actually ask the question, are you okay? And ask that question not from a point of sophistry or just politeness, but genuinely because you give a shit. Because you actually give a shit. I can tell you for free that I've had instances in my life where I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to make it out of this. Yeah. Vosit Tembewa just made that admission to you. Of course I have. Of course. Let's think about what I've done and what I've achieved. I was on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine before I was 30 years old. I sold a business that I'd built to 140 million rand before I was 30 years old. I was featured on Forbes before I was 27. And you know what happened when I hit 30, 31? I crashed. And here's why I crashed. My entire identity had always been framed by being the young guy doing well. My entire story was I was the young guy doing well. And when I hit 30, I wasn't the young guy anymore. I wasn't the underdog anymore. I would walk into rooms and people would know who I am. And whilst there is the credit to the work you've done, it's also an incredible amount of weight to carry. Because then you start wondering, am I who these people say I am? Or am I who I feel like today? And sometimes I don't feel great today. I don't feel great. I'm coming into your space today just to say the following. I think for South Africans who are watching this specifically, and my audience is global, but for the South Africans, the recent passing of, um, you know, King Yakoti, uh, Ricky Rick, should be a reminder to all of us that every single moment is special. There are some of you watching this right now who have an app with a blue bird on your phone and all you do when you wake up every single morning is you look for the next person to attack, the next person to tease, and the next person to drag. There is this new culture that's taken hold now where people are creating podcasts that aren't really podcasts. It's people sitting down looking at a camera and attacking people and speaking vitriol about people. The only thing I want to say to you is this. Just get right with the Lord and get right with yourself. Because if there is one thing you need to know, it's this. The arc of life is very, very long. You're sitting at the other end now and you have the power. You don't know where things take you. You're sitting at the other end now insulting someone. You don't know what they're going through. I'm not sure when it became in vogue to be such absolute assholes. I don't know when that became a thing. But I think to those of us who understand what that means, I think you have a responsibility just to, to be kind and genuinely kind. I'm gonna give you some advice somebody gave me when I was much younger, and it's probably the most valuable piece of advice I ever got. When you're building a brand, you can't afford to have an ego. You gotta do whatever it takes to build it. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna tell you guys who actually gave me that advice. True story, George Sombonos. Uh, George Sombonos uh, is past now. He used to run a company called Chicken Lickin'. And uh, true story, I was, I was in the Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker had a prize that they used to give to successful entrepreneurs, right? And George is in the running to win the prize. And uh, I get to him, I'm like, this is, this is good as nice. And he's wearing this like old shoddy suit and I'm looking at him going, are you as good as nice? It's good, it's good, it's good. And I'm like, are you that guy? Because he didn't look, you know, he's, about, he's a short guy. I'm like, it doesn't look like him. So we end, up, we end up chatting, and true, two weeks later, I'm driving past a chicken licking on William Nickel, and I'm hungry. This was before I had a specialized eating plan, you know? So I was, so I was, like, so I was like, let me pull in. So I pull into the chicken licking to buy some food, and I see this guy picking up papers outside the chicken licking. There's a bit of litter, and he's picking, and I'm like, that looks like George. I can't be George. Like, this is the guy, he owns the franchise. He can't be picking up, and it was him. 
So I go through the drive-through. At the time, I had a, it was my first car, Toyota Run X. So I finished buying. I go through the drive-through and I pull up in the parking and, I, I, and he remembered me. He's like, hi, George. He's like, yeah, Vusi, I remember you. I said, why are you picking up papers? He says, what do you mean? He was, he was genuinely puzzled. I'm like, why are you picking up papers? He says, no, because they are here. This is my shop. <laughs> And the papers, they need to be picked up, right? Because in my mind, I'm going, I would have come in and gone, Elon, Ela, Ewen. <laughs> There's papers, you know, that's what I would have done. Right? I, would have, <laughs> I, I wouldn't, you know. <laughs> but he's, he's looking, he's genuinely puzzled at me being puzzled that he's picking up papers. So I'm like, but you own this whole thing. And at the time, I think he had like 120 or 130 franchises. I'm like, you own this thing. Why would you pick up papers? And he said to me, when you're building a brand, you can't afford an ego. Yeah. He says, because the customer that drives past doesn't go, who picked up the papers? They just go, are the papers picked up, yes or no? I grew up, I grew up without, I suffered, I was told I'm worthless. Now that I have it, I'm gonna show everybody. Because if they affirm to me that I am, then I must be. And it's not until you get to a stage where you realize the affirmation is not necessary, that you're truly free. So as you build your business, I'm telling you now that if it's the external affirmation you're looking for, you're gonna sickle. You're not gonna get it, guys. It's hard, like, and it's, it's not unless you walk the journey, right? It's when you are in it that you're like, why don't they get it? Yeah, the world must be, they're losing their minds. Have you ever seen something that nobody else sees, but you know it's there, because you can see it. You're like, nah, and you explain it, but they don't see it, right? And in that, the only thing that keeps you sane is if the only affirmation you need is you. So it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Quickly, before we start, I gotta tell you this. I'll tell you why it's counterintuitive. Um, anthropologists and human science specialists both have studied prisons. Prisons are a fascinating thing, right? Because when you're a human being, what we do in this thing called a society, very careful of society, by the way, because society is nothing more than a system of normalized averages. So, so, so what it is is, we all come together and we go, well, for us, for there to be order in any system that can grow exponentially, ergo population growth, we need a system to manage it. And we're gonna codify the system and we're gonna call these things good behavior, etiquette, rules, laws. If you break them, we're gonna punish you. We have to do it, otherwise there'll be disorder. Like if nobody tells you, sit on the right-hand side of the car and drive on the left-hand side of the road, you're gonna sit wherever you want, you're gonna drive however you want. And we can't create a society like that. So what society does is it writes these rules, it codifies them, that create the average for the average. The average human being should be like this. That's why your mom says, go to school, get a good education, get a job, get a husband, have two and a half kids, live in the White House with a picket fence. That's why you're told that, because your mother comes from a society with a system of normalized averages. And then you come up and go, no, nah, maybe not. Maybe I don't want to finish school. Or maybe I do, but I actually don't want to get a job. I actually want to go through five years of not knowing where my next meet is going to come from, because I've got a dream. The minute you break away from society's rules, it'll do exactly what they do to you in prison. So check this out. So you break the law, they send you to prison. Why? Because if we can remove you from broader society, we punish you. Yeah? Human beings, by their very nature, need interaction. This is a vital part of being a human being. When you're in prison and you break the rules, what do they do then? They put you in isolation. So just to be clear, to the strongest, toughest, most evil people of society, the single most powerful form of punishing them is separation. It's not physical punishment. It's I'm gonna put you in a hole, alone. That's it. And it will break you. That's why people don't have the courage to walk the path of entrepreneurship. Because the minute you're walking, you're going, holy shit, I'm alone. The hardest part about failing that people battle with is not necessarily the failure, it's the emotion attached to the failure. Because we, we come from, you know, human beings are uh, social creatures. So that's why you live with your family. You don't live alone. That's why you live in a society and a community. That's why you go to a church. 
That's why you go to an office and everywhere you go, when you get there, there are other human beings. Human beings are social creatures. And a part of being a social creature is, it is feedback. So you have the friends you have because you like the feedback. When you make a joke, they laugh. Um, you, you go to the places you go to because you like the feedback. So as human beings, we're in a constant system of feedback. When you went to school, at the end of a term, you wrote a test or an exam for feedback. The hardest part about failing is you don't like the feedback because, because you don't know if you failed or if the business failed because you are the business, you're the entrepreneur. And so you, you have to deal with these emotions attached to failure. And then what happens is you start questioning yourself. You start asking questions like, am I really as good as I think I am? Like, am I really this good? Or has it just been my ego this whole time? And then you go back to the time when there was a guy in high school who told you you'd, be a, you'd, you'd amount to nothing. Or an ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend who told you that you would amount to nothing. And you go, maybe they were right. You know what's funny about human beings is if you wrote a test and you got 70%, your mind doesn't see the, the answers you got right. When you go through the exam paper after you get it back from your teacher, you look for the answers you got wrong because that's how we're wired as human beings. So if you have had a hundred people tell you you're amazing and three people tell you you are useless, you will always remember the three people. It's what I call, it's, it's what's called the imposter syndrome. So your internal dialogue starts being framed by negative perceptions of self, by self, based on the perceptions of others. Hmm. So the, the real problem with failure is because it, it supports the three people who told you you were worth nothing, not the 97 who told you you're amazing. So for me, that was like the hardest part, right? Like the hardest part was going, the hardest part was having to understand that I was not that failure, that the failure didn't define me, that it was, it was a moment, you know, it was, it happened and, um, you know, and I needed to move on from it. Um, and that failing doesn't make you any less of what you were. You're still great, you're still amazing, you're still smart and intelligent and hardworking, you're still all of those things, all of those things about you are true. The event does not define you. It's just an event. You're an athlete that showed up to run a 100 meter race and had a bad race. Doesn't mean you're a bad athlete. You had a bad race. Leadership is about moments. And what makes great leaders is how they rise to the moment of leadership. You see, you can't lead until the moment actually arrives to lead. It's not built into the ether. It's the moment to lead. That's important. The challenge with many of us is when that moment arrives, we question, we doubt, we obfuscate. We go, me? No, oh, not me. What about so and so? Why don't they do it? Why don't they say it? Or worse, we make that terrible statement. It beckons often at the back of our heads. It's like a resounding, grazing, nasal chamber. Why me? Why you? Why not you? It's that old Tibetan saying, which was translated into English. If not you, who? If not now, when? The moment of leadership is critical. And what people often misunderstand is the moment of leadership often goes to the people who don't have the position and they don't have the power, but they exercise the influence. My creator put me on this earth for a specific assignment. So I've got a job to do. Now, people often misunderstand assignment for destination. Mm. Those are not the same things. Assignment is the job to do. Destination is the place to go. And in going to the place, I have the job to do. Mm. All right. Your question was around, how does he link that to his purpose? Mm. It's a tough question to answer because many people often don't think about their assignment on earth. Yeah. What are you here for? Mm. 
So we, we, we think often about, just think about it. We go to school. At school, we're taught to get a skill. You get a skill. With that skill, you're taught to make an income. You make an income. With that income, you're taught to spend it. Mm. Where is assignment there? Where's purpose? Where, where does it connect? Right. Right? Yeah. Um, this is, by, by the way, why I have a great respect and reverence for people in the creative arts. Because people in the creative arts, literally every single day, choose their assignment. Absolutely. And often they choose their assignment, applying their skill in a sector that will never pay them what they're truly worth. Like, I don't think we've paid Brenda Fassi what she was truly worth. Mm. True. We didn't pay Mahlatini what he was truly yes. worth. Mm. Do you understand? Mm. Like, these people influenced the time, a, a mm. generation. They left us all richer. We have memories that, you know, as children were created to the songs of Ulaki Dube. Mm. And I'm not sure we paid him what he was truly worth. Yeah. So the question for people who ask the question around, what is my purpose, is do you understand your assignment? Like, why are you here? Yes. Mm. And that's not yeah. a question Vosi can answer for you. Mm. That's a question you can answer for yourself in a conversation with your creator. Mm. Why are you here? Absent of you on earth, what would be missing? What's your contribution? Mm. And when you move on, what is the thing you will leave behind that will live the world and leave the world a much better place than you found it? It's a deep, deep question. All of us here at the beginning of a new year write these things called New Year's resolutions. And then it, you, you know, you, New Year's resolutions, number one, make more money. Yeah? Uh, number two, uh, change my boyfriend. Number three, get into shape. Yeah? Number three, get into shape is somewhere in the top three. So what do you do? You go to the gym, you get a gym membership. Yeah? You buy, you go to the local uh, Nike store and you buy like all of your gym gear. You are motivated. You are inspired. You are going to the damn gym. You go to YouTube, you subscribe to all of the fitness channels. You go to your Instagram, you follow all of the fitness models. You are motivated. You are going to the damn gym. You're going to get in shape. That's what you're going to do. The people you're following on YouTube have been working on for a minimum of five years to look like that. So you have the incorrect understanding that after a month of working out, you're going to look like them. So what happens in the first month? You're excited. You go to gym every single month. You know, and you take the pains and your body is sore, but you know, I'm excited. I'm going to gym. Then life happens. Company doesn't make money. You don't make your targets. You fall a bit ill. Something happens. And all of a sudden, you stop going to gym for a day. A day becomes two. Two becomes a week. Now all of a sudden, you've had a gym membership for three months and you haven't been in that time. What did, what did you miss? You thought motivation was the formula. Winners don't need motivation. Winners need discipline. Discipline's about getting it done because it needs to get done, not because I feel like it, not because I'm motivated for it. You think Nelson Mandela was motivated to spend 27 years in prison? <laughs> you think Martin Luther King was motivated to march across the states and proclaim freedom? You think, you know, if you look at people that change the world, they're not doing it because they're motivated. They're doing it because they made a commitment to do it and they disciplined to see it through. Discipline is far more important than motivation. Which is why you've got to be careful the decisions you make. Because once you make the decision, you have to see that decision through. Like my mentor says, first we make the decisions, then the decisions make us. So you've got to be very careful the decisions you make. Be very careful the commitments you make. Motivation, I'm telling you now, is completely overrated. It's important. Don't get me wrong. You know, we meet according to motivation. We feel good. Rah, rah. But uh, that'll fade. You need a stronger will and a deeper commitment to see things through. I think life is a lot about life is a lot about who you who you are mm. and how you show up when the losses happen. Mm. Um, any, anybody anybody can be a superstar when it's winning season. Yeah. Um, and and it's easy to believe in yourself when you're on a winning streak. Yeah. But when you get tested, when you lose, when things go wrong, when you're when you're you know, and 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 if there's one thing I've learned actually is this. It's a great way to start our conversation. It is that talent is mm. overrated. Mm. That speed is the most important commodity you have. Mm. That time must never, ever be wasted. Mm. And most importantly, that somebody with grit and hunger will mm. always mm. outperform people around them. If you, yeah. if you have the ability to hang on when things get tough and you're, and you're hungry for what you want, you'll succeed.
You, you, you will succeed. It's like, it's a law written into the universe. It's like gravity. You jump off a 20-story building, gravity is going to pull you down. If yeah. you have grit and hunger, it doesn't matter how you look, where you come from, how you speak, what they say about you, how long it takes. If you have grit and you have hunger, you will definitely succeed. We live in a, in a very me mechanistic world where people are looking for the formula. That's why I said there's no template to life. People are looking for that formula that it can just apply. It's like Excel. You can, you know, there's a formula, you plug in the inputs and out comes the output. So, and that's how people treat wealth. I think people treat wealth and meaning like that. People go, well, so you got wealth. What's the, what's the formula? There, mm. there is not. There's a, you know, there's a, a bit of experimentation. There's a plug and a play somewhere. There's something I'm copying from somebody else. I got a board member of mine who said, sometimes you have to case life. I said, what is case? He says, copy and steal everything. Right. I was like, wow, that's, that's really, really good. Right. So and there are parts where I'm experimenting new things and trying stuff for the first time that it works. There are parts where we steal a little bit from somebody else and then that works. Then there are parts where you do both and it fails. But what you're constantly looking for is to fail upward. So that wherever we fail, we're failing at a level different to the level we we're trying at. And that's just about move yourself upward to the next level. The hardest way to create wealth, mm -hmm. it's also the most rewarding way to create wealth, but the hardest way to create wealth is to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Because if you follow the flow of the income statement and you see who gets paid first, if yeah. you just go through the income, first the suppliers, then you pay your staff, then you pay the government taxes, then you pay the bank interest, then you pay yourself dividends. So mm -hmm. the entrepreneur in the business gets paid last. But Unless we go through an education system that teaches us these things, mm. what happens is we breed entrepreneurs, you're seeing it now, mm. who think entrepreneurship is instant money. Oh, Do you see? Yeah. Whereas any, any person who's a real entrepreneur, and I'm not with respect, mm. I'm not talking about people who pose as entrepreneurs, I'm talking real entrepreneurs, mm. will tell you that it takes a long time and it's very hard. So that's why you need an education for people who want to be an entrepreneur. And it doesn't have to be commercial education. Mm. Like you can go study architecture, it doesn't matter. As long study, as you've studied the discipline study of the thing. repetition. Like study the thing, be in yeah. the thing. You know the mistake we often make, because particularly in South Africa, we love the idea of owning a business, mm. right? True. We don't think about, the, a business is an instrument for the work. It's not the purpose for existing. Yeah. If you think about it. So if I want to do creative work, say, mm -hmm. um, and I register a business, that there is a COVID doesn't mean I can't do the creative work. Mm. It just means I can't operate the business. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the answer for him might be to think about how does he offer his skills to people who still require his skills without necessarily getting them to sign a contract with his business. Mm. Um, it's very big now, right? It's called this thing called the gig economy. So there might be something for him to try. We yeah. use it in our firm. Uh, there are several like this. There's a platform called TaskRabbit. We use Upwork. And all of those are global platforms where, say, I want a logo designed. Mm. I go on it and I say, I need somebody to design a logo. Yeah. And it will publish to 10,000 logo designers around the world that Uvosi in Joburg needs a logo designed. He's willing to pay $25 an hour. Do you want to bid for the work? So that might be something for him to consider rather than I've started a business, I can't do a website, I can't, I can't, I can't. Mm. He should take his skill and make this skill available on an ecosystem that already exists. The older I've gotten and the more experience I've received, or the more experience I've had rather, and the more guidance I've received from people that I look up to, people I call mirrors of mine. One of the things I've learned is that there is no template for life. Mm. And, so, <laughs> and so, you know, there's this idea that there are certain uh, truths that are so universal that they are, um, that they are without nuance. Um, and that's not true. Um, every, every bit of truth has a nuance to it. So, the reason I'm saying that is, is because I, I've become fairly reticent when people ask me the question. So, and somebody actually asked me the question yesterday, a young entrepreneur who was like, I've got these four businesses. Should I do what everybody says, which is like dump three and focus on one, or should I keep all four going? And I ended up saying to him what I'll say to you, which is I actually don't know. <laughs> because I think our parts are different. And I think our parts find manifestation in ways that are different. I have come to realize that there are no perfect decisions, but decisions that I make perfect. Yeah. That is something else that I loved reading in your book. Yeah. Walk I mean, me through that garden. Again, right? It's, 
So, so remember, you're in this journey. You're doing this thing called life. You're building this thing called a business. You're in pursuit of this this end goal called profit and somewhere in between it, the pursuit of purpose. You're trying to create a, a better workplace for your people, a, a place where they can come and belong. You want to serve communities. You want to better the lives of customers. There are a thousand things you want to do. And so we go to business schools and business schools, particularly the ones I went to, yeah. teach you about, they give you case studies and they go, this business leader did X and that business leader did X. And there's like this literature that says they make perfect decisions. Uh. Then when I spend time with business leaders, I realize they don't. Most of them just make a decision. Yeah. And they're comfortable in the knowledge that decisions are meta by their nature, which yeah. is to say, I'm going to get on the freeway and just go from one place, I'm going to another. Yeah. In my head, I kind of have a path of how I'm going to get there. Uh. But if on the way there's traffic, I'm going to change the route. If I hit a pothole, I'll stop and fix. But I'm going there. But I'm going to get there. So fig. And this is the thing about the perfect decision rather than the decision made perfect. The decision made perfect builds into it the assumption and the knowledge that mm. I'm going to get things wrong. And I'm comfortable with getting things wrong. Because it's when you think you have to make perfect decisions that you get into the most dangerous thing leaders do. Ego, bravado, oh. knowledge, arrogance, this walk in and like, I own it. No, you don't. Though we've always done it this way. No, no. Yeah. Like, you're a part of a process. You're a servant. Sit down. The hardest thing to do is to, is to enable people to see themselves as they are. Not as they hoped they were, not as they've been taught they are, but as they actually are. It's the single hardest thing to do, and I'll tell you why. Because we're all embedded in this construct of a thing called identity, right? And so, and what people forget is identity by its very nature, one is man-made and two is exclusive. What that means is the minute I say I'm male, it means I'm not female. If I say I'm black, it means I'm not white. If I say I'm African, it means I'm not American. If I say I am you know, educated, it means I'm not illiterate. So all the little words we use to construct identity put us in a box. They don't free us, right? And it's something people, I think, don't think about because people today have assumed an identity for who they are. And it's, it's all over, right? It's in the media, it's on social media, it's on TV, it's in the newspapers, it's in, in music videos. All you're being sold is an identity. This is what you should be based on where you come from and based on how you've been socialized. Very early on, my father taught me that I didn't have to be what society told me, right? That I could be different if I wanted I want to. I want to put that in context and see if I'm understanding what you're saying. So um, I read Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom. It f with me, dude. That book is so good. <laughs> I, I, like when every second I think I'm a badass and then I remember that the man faced 27 years in prison and refused to compromise his principles. I'm just not that hardcore. And yeah. <laughs> like, so that, that's just phenomenal. And I remember him saying in the book, he was like, this, this is Nelson Mandela talking. He said, I got on an airplane and the pilot was black. And for a minute I was scared because I didn't think black people could fly a plane. And he was like, what the f Like, how do I think that? And he said, if that had seeped into my mind, identity, right? Then how many other people had accepted something less than who they were because of what society had told them? Is that what you mean? That we're sort of subtly taking exactly. on these I can'ts, I can'ts, I can'ts? Exactly. So um, here's a great example. I'm short, therefore I can't model. Okay. I mean, it's not, it's not established that short people should model, but whether you should or whether you can are very different tests, right? Um, and by the way, I approach every little thing in my life like that. Like it, all the shit I do, I go, I shouldn't, but it doesn't mean I can't. There's a big difference. So if you're telling me I shouldn't be in the room, you may be correct. It doesn't mean I don't have the capacity to be in the room. I'm gonna force my way in and I'm gonna get to change your mind. So this thing about identity, I think is so powerful because in today's world where we've, you know, we're no longer demographics, we're a psychographic now. There is a kid living in Kuala Lumpur who's never been out of Kuala Lumpur who sounds like a kid in Brooklyn, New York because he's watching Jay-Z on, on YouTube. But he, so he's completely immersed in that culture and he's never left his small little village, right? And that's exactly the point is everything you've been taught you are, somebody taught you that's what you are. Now, you can keep that identity, but again, you can't get the progress. And so what a lot of people do is they hang on to it, right? In South Africa, it, um, it's often about gender. Sometimes it's about tribe, right? So what tribe you come from, there's a big generation issue. So it's, I'm part of it, this generation. Yeah, all those things are true, but do you want the identity or do you want the progress? 
because you can't have both. Um, I'll tell you just quickly a, a story. So my dad was the sensei in the dojo, right? And I used to train with my dad in the dojo. And so I asked him one time, I was like, how come we get to change belts? Like, I mean, couldn't you teach the methodology without the belt system? He said two things. He said, first, human beings are incentive-based, so you need something to aim for. But he said, the second thing is the reason we give you a belt is because it assigns an identity. Now, it doesn't mean that if you're orange belt, you can't take on a brown belt. It's just you embed that in your mind and you go, well, he's senior then, therefore. And so one of the things he said to me, one of the things you're going to have to learn is that real life doesn't have a belt system. So everything we know and have learned about identity is given to us. It's a, it's a template that somebody has given you. And you can just choose to run that script of Macross or not. If you want another awesome video in our Black Excellence series, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.